because uh, any, any decent person is appalled at the thought of any violence against any uh, innocent person. Uh, but especially children and especially, it seems, women. People tend to be less, you know, you're sympathetic to a man that gets beat up, but you tend to be less sympathetic than if you see a big hulking brute and something about a smaller woman and you see that maybe in a domestic violence setting that this man is clearly brutalizing uh, that woman. Uh, some of the violence involved in VAWA also, uh, also involves rape. Uh, which of course is a, is a tragic and uh, is a tragic issue and a very emotional issue. Uh, so, so there was a lot of emotion uh, in Warsaw. But again, by a five to four decision, the Supreme Court said uh, this, this is important, but it's not interstate commerce. Now, of course, the actions that were being addressed by VAWA, those are a felony in all 50 states. This isn't about letting criminals get off the hook. You beat someone, whether they're uh, a woman or not, whether they're an innocent person or whether you think they had it coming, the reality is if you engage in a violent act against another human being that's not in some form of self-defense or other justified or excused situation, uh, states, state and local authorities are more than able to prosecute those crimes and they do so every day. But by a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court said this is not an issue for the federal government. So all of a sudden, the Commerce Clause was brought back to life. Now, there are those who will say that in 2005, Gonzalez v. Reich, that the Supreme Court eradicated all of those gains in terms of resuscitating the Commerce Clause, uh, when in 2005, the Supreme Court said that, uh, that the federal government was able to outlaw the growing of pot in California. Now, this was a case brought under kind of I mean, frankly, something of, of, uh, of a radical libertarian theory. It wasn't exactly a conservative argument, nor would I say it was necessarily even a mainstream libertarian argument. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was giving the Supreme Court a, a horse bill, and they, they choked on it. Even then, only by 5-4 on the Commerce Clause question, there was a sixth vote, but it was a necessary and proper clause. Um, and, and I agree that, that the race decision is real problematic for people who want to have any real limits on federal power under the Commerce Clause. But the issue is that I, I think race is just wicked revisiting. If you're growing marijuana, that is uh, an economically valuable asset. There are people who, in breaking the law, sell quantities of marijuana for money. So if you're involved growing pot in your backyard, that is, in a commercial standpoint, it is no different than Farmer Wickard growing wheat in his backyard. And so I don't believe that race is as devastating to the issue of Commerce Clause jurisprudence as some people make it. Uh, it just seems to be Wickard. Again, if you're growing a crop that you can sell for cash, the fact that you were going to sit in your room and smoke it, well, that's like Wickard feeding his wheat to his family. It, it, it's, it's the same dynamic. It's important in the law to stick with the neutral principles and not get overly weeded down in the facts. So, I believe that the line you find in Russia from the Commerce Clause cases, without overturning any precedent, is that current Commerce Clause doctrine only allows Congress to regulate activity wherein people have voluntarily chosen to engage in commercial action. Once they choose to engage in economic activity, then it becomes a debate of, is this activity within the ambit, broadly defined, of interstate commerce? Does it have a substantial effect on interstate commerce? But in this case, you are not regulated when you choose to visit a doctor's office and have to pay. You're not regulated when you choose to buy medicine. I mean, you can think of ways they could have done this to have an individual trigger that then you're under the mandate where you have to have insurance. Instead, you're sitting at home watching TV, minding your own business. All of a sudden, you are under this mandate. This is not regulating activity. It is regulating inactivity. And there's a difference. Otherwise put, it's a difference between regulating action versus coercing action where there is none. That's not a difference in degree. That's a difference in kind. The Supreme Court has never permitted that before. It has never been faced with an opportunity. None of its cases stand for the proposition that the government can force you 
to engage in interstate commerce. And so, as a result, doesn't mean that there's no precedent clearly against it, but it would represent a significant step beyond existing precedent. So anyone who chooses to cast this issue of, look, precedent leads to this, oh, the heck it does. Uh, it's, it, 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 it's a mile beyond that. And in fact, the closing, uh, closing part of the Lopez decision from 95 is all the more applicable here. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, writing for the court in that decision, where they were looking at the Clinton administration's argument in that case, said, if we were to accept the government's argument as to why this is part of interstate commerce, it is difficult for the members of this court to posit any activity that would be beyond the power of the federal government to control. In other words, such a holding would eviscerate the concept that there are any meaningful limits on the power of the federal government. And the Supreme Court says, we're not going to do that. There are limits to federal power. I think the reasoning in Lopez applies a fortiori to this case, where this isn't even an issue of possessing a firearm and whether it's perpetually in interstate commerce. This is an issue of a person's doing nothing, and all of a sudden you have roped them in to interstate commerce. So I think for those reasons, uh, I believe the mandate, if that's all it can stand on, would be struck down. Now I took almost all my time on that. In five minutes, I'm just going to hit other things. The government, understanding, I think, that it might be in real danger here, has alternative arguments, always arguing the alternative. They say, if this isn't Commerce Clause, don't worry, this is authorized by our tax and then spending power under the General Welfare Clause. <coughs> If not that, then it's authorized independently under just the concept of general welfare. And even if it's not, it's authorized by the necessary and proper clause. Now, if we do, were doing a semester-long class, I could easily take a class with each of those topics instead of having it in three minutes. The Supreme Court has held that a tax, and this is as recently, uh, where did he get this? Well, yeah, it cut this, well, I'm about to say, sure, there's a case that comes from in 1904, there's a case in 1922, but it was all reaffirmed in the 1980s in the Rosenberger v. Rectors and Visitors of the University of Virginia case. So check out Rosenberger, where the, where the court reaffirmed all of this in modern case law and in post-New Deal and post-Switch in Time to Save Nine case law that a tax is an extraction of money from a private entity to the government treasury, to the public treasury, for the support of government activity. It is the government taking your money and then spending it. This is not a tax. The government's not taking your money. They're telling you how you have to spend your own money. They are commandeering and co-opting all of your private property and saying whatever you have in your bank account, we're going to tell you how to spend it. Now again, the problem with that argument is that there is no limiting principle. If they can tell you to buy health insurance, they can tell you what kind of food to buy. They can tell you what kind of car to buy. They can tell you that you have to exercise, you have to buy a gym membership, and they're demanding for a gym membership. They can tell you where you go to school, what you can do on vacation, whether you can eat dessert, I mean, the reasoning underlying one has absolutely no limits to it. Because all their argument there comes to is, well, this is an issue of we want people to be healthy. Well, my goodness, we can stretch out any aspect of life to do that. Now, there are those who will say, yeah, I was about to go back to Commerce Clause. I think we've covered Commerce Clause enough. Uh, so that's the tax and spending clause, is that a tax is the government you're take, is taking your money. That's not the case here. But even if it were a tax, it would still be unconstitutional. Because Article I uh, and the 16th Amendment only permit four types of taxation. Those are excises, which are when you pay your fees to become a member of the bar. That's an excise tax. It's either a sin tax on the consumption of something like ta uh, tobacco or alcohol, or it's the, the tax for a business license for a doctor or a lawyer to do something that involves the public trust. Excises. Duties and imposts, which are taxed.